السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. إحدنا السراط المستقيم. سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ولنا محمد ولنا على سيدنا سيدنا ولنا محمد مبارك صلى الله عليه سلام وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله. We continue talking about Imam Hussein al-Islam in Karbala. We left off last week when he was going to give a or deliver a sermon or talk to the forces of Yazid. Before I get into that, you know, a couple of weeks ago I would mentioned you know, about Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas talking about the status of Sayyidina Ali, Karam Allah Waj. And you know, he mentioned three things that he said that if I had any one of those three things which were given to Ali, then it would be more to him than basically the world. The last one of those was if you remember, and I did go into this, and I want to kind of go into this a little bit before we continue, is when the Christians of Najran came to debate with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they lost a debate, but they were still stuck on, oh no, we still believe. And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala commanded to do a mubahila, which is where each side comes and, and prays that whoever is the liar, Allah's curse be upon them. And of course, Rasulullah Sallam took with him four people along with, with himself five. And this is referred to in verse number 61 of Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, where that part of the verse Allah Subhanahu wa refers to, uh, refers to this, where he says, فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ لَدُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ That you say to them, come and call upon your sons, or upon our sons and, and your sons, and our women and your women, and ourselves and yourselves. So when the verse is revealed, Rasulullah leaves the house and he calls Hassan and Hussein, alayhi salam, and he calls Bibi Fatima, and he calls Sayyidina Ali, alayhi salam. And then he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he takes them in the sheet, he says, Allahumma haulahi ahli, that Allah only these are my family. Now the verse says to call upon your sons and their sons. So we see Rasulullah Sallallahu took as his sons Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain Alayhi Salaam. And it says, your women and their women. And yet he only calls one woman. You know, Nisa is plural. And in Arabic plural is three or more. And yet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi only calls upon his daughter. Because in reality she is representing all of the women. You know, she is a daughter to her father, a wife to her husband, and a mother to her children. And she is the one whom Allah, who Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said will be the, the leader of the women of Jannah. So in Jannah, you will have not only the wives of the prophets, but also the mothers of prophets. And yet the daughter of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi is the leader of them all. But the point I want to emphasize here is it says, call upon yourselves and themselves. 
of course, Rasulullah co goes himself, but he takes Ali with him as himself, as the self, as the nafs. You know, and there is no one else who can, who can claim this status. There is no one else for whom Rasulullah referred to him as Lamaka Lahmi wa Damaka Dahmi. That your flesh is my flesh and your blood is my blood. Only to Ali. And so now coming back to where we left off last week. Now, this was, as I mentioned, this was the day was the ninth of. Muharram. So on the ninth day of Muharram, which is a Thursday, that year it was a Thursday. So early that day, Imam Hussein al Islam, he goes in front of the forces of Yazid. And if you remember, he had requested them for water when they cut it off on, on the 7th. They refused. Even when he emphasized, okay, you don't give it to us, at least give it to the women and the children. And they said, no. Everything he had asked for them, from them, you know, he said one of three things, pick, pick one of three choices. They refused. And so now he goes before them. And after praising and glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and sending salatu salam on Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to them, he says that my grandfather has taught us that if a believer sees a ruler, who is making what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal, haram, and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram, halal, He is creating things within the religion Himself, and doing away with the sunnah of Rasulullah he is treating the wealth of the people like his own personal wealth. The wealth that is collected in Bayt al -Ma like his own, his own property. And he is oppressing the people. And if that believer, within his capacity, whether verbally or physically, does not oppose him, then on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, along with that leader being thrown in hell, will also throw that believer with him in hell. And you are aware, and he says to them, he says, you are aware that Yazid and his people, you know, his friends, his companions, those that are in his administration, That they are, they have left the way of Rahman. You know, left the way of Allah. They have left the way of Rahman and adopted the way of Shaitan. <coughs> and they are making things that are unlawful, lawful. And things that are lawful, unlawful. And they are doing away or trampling over the sunnah of Rasulullah and bringing their own way and oppressing the people and this and what they are doing they are doing to the, to the, to the religion that was brought by my grandfather And so it is more of a responsibility upon me. He says that this is my responsibility that I should stand up first to, to defend the, the religion that my grandfather has brought. And you know, he and he also he he, he reminds them of who he himself is. You know, again, people forget this. You know, if you look at when this ha this incident happens, 
The year is 61 Hijri, the beginning of 61 Hijri. When did the last Sahaba or companion of Rasulullah Sussum pass away? 106 Hijri. 40 years, what, 45 years later. So you still have a span of 45 years where you still have people who know, who saw Rasulullah with Iman, who still have that Iman, and they understand and know the status of Imam Hussein alayhi So he says to them, he says, you know who I am. And if you don't know who I am, there are people amongst you who know who I am. None of these things that he's doing, you know, even when he's giving them the options of, okay, pick one of these three options. Or he says, please give us water. And now when he goes and addresses them, he's not doing that because he thinks they're going to change their minds. He's done all of these things so that on the day of judgment, they can't come before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, if he had only asked us for water, we would have given him water. Well, he asked. Now you have no excuse. Oh, we didn't know who he was. You know, this famous thing of politicians, you know, when they got caught with, with some crook. I, oh, I don't know who that is. Oh, we didn't know who, who he is. So we, that's why we, we did this. We were just following orders. So he has erased all of those excuses. So that on the day of judgment they have no excuse. And it won't be just this one time. He will go before them on the day, on the, the next day as well, in the middle of the fighting, and address them again and again. But if we look at what he said, you know, when he talks about governments, people that are rulers, oppressors. Rasulullah Sallallahu said that the Khilafah is for 30 years. So the Khilafah ended with when Imam Hassan al-Islam handed over the rule. Now, no one can say he handed over the Khilafah. He didn't hand over the Khilafah. There was no Khilafah. This Rasulullah Sussum said 30 years. So on that, on that last day of the 30th year, Imam Hassan al-Islam walked away and he handed over the rule. With conditions, of course. And then Rasulullah Sussum said, will come the age of cruel monarchy. Which if we look at it historically, lasted until the end of the Ottomans. Amongst these monarchs, you have a handful that were decent rulers. Such as Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahmatullahi And that's why you have the narrations where Rasulullah says that if a, if a pious king does something, because he knew that there would be people like that, of course. And then after the cruel monarchy will come the age of Tyrants. Even though amongst the monarchs, many of them also rule like tyrants. So this is the age we are in today. You look throughout the Muslim world. Doesn't matter what country you're looking at. Tyrants. Oppressors. Who are doing everything that Imam Hussein al-Islam said about such rulers that they would do. I mean, you look at the rulers in the Muslim world today. They are making what is halal haram. You know, you look at the Wahhabi ideology, which was established in order to rule over the Muslims. You know, this is why Lawrence of Arabia went to Arabia. Was to establish this ideology and then spread it throughout Arabia. 
you know, because they created this Arab nationalism. And so you had all of these coups going on in all these places, and these are the people that they established into those, those coups. You know, you look at Egypt when Nasser, uh, uh, you know, Jamal came, or Gamal, as they would say. So when Nasser comes, what does he do? First thing he does, most of the decent scholars, he beheads them. So what happens when you clear cut a forest? The weeds pop up, which is exactly what happened. So as soon as that vacuum is created, what do the Saudis do? They start sending ideologists to go and change the people's ideology. Same thing in Iraq, same thing in Jordan, Sham, all of North Africa in reality, everywhere, throughout the Muslim world. In places where they couldn't come and set their own ru rulers up, what do they do? They bought the scholars, like in the subcontinent. They buy the scholars, because they're, they're, the British themselves were the rulers, so they buy the scholars. You know, they have Ismail Delby who comes, who, who, who writes the book Taqwiyatul uh, Iman, which in reality, if you read it, is nothing but a tr Urdu translation of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab's Kitab al Tawheed. The whole thing is to push this ideology, which distances you from Allah without knowing it. In reality, you're being distanced from Allah, but you're being distanced in, from Allah under the name of Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. Because, yeah, you're being pushed away from Allah. How? Because you're in reality, you're being distanced from the Messenger himself. <coughs> so, yeah. Now you start looking at him like a postman who simply brought a message, brought a letter to you. But the postman has nothing to do with the letter. Whereas Rasulullah didn't simply bring the message, he is the message. So if you look like, you know, what, what they did in, in, in Saudi Arabia, I don't even like calling it Saudi Arabia because, you know, that's the name of, they named it after their, you know, their, their king. You know, they bring in the ideology kill most of the decent Imams and then put their own people in these positions and since now they have a pulpit you know there unfortunately many people think that oh anybody that's speaking from some pulpit he must have some authority he must know something you know it's like the internet these days anybody can put anything out there but oh see it's in the it's on the internet it must have some credibility to it So what's the first thing they do? Ah, everything's haram. Bida. And this again, Rasulullah he said, a time will come when the people will call my sunnah bida. They will call his way an innovation. This is exactly what they did. You know, you, you can't, be happy at the, at the birth of Rasulullah. Oh, this is bid'ah. When in reality it is sunnah. Not only the sunnah of Rasulullah, so some, but also the sunnah of the companions of Rasulullah. They say, oh, uh, you know, Saying Ya Rasulullah or calling on Rasulullah, so this is bid'ah, this is shirk, this is haram. I mean, even worse than haram, this is shirk. This is associating partners with Allah because you've made him equal to Allah. Because their concept of Allah is very small. That's why it's easy to make things equal to Allah for them. So they do all of these things, and then the other side, what happens is, you know, one, they're making, you know, things that are lawful, unlawful, and then they start making things that are unlawful, I mean, 
uh, yeah, things that are unlawful, lawful. In the same, same sweep. That it's lawful for them to, to take the aid of the non-Muslim governments. To fight against the Muslims. I mean, you look at any Muslim country these days. Whatever agenda they have, that's what these, you know, they have their scholars that they bought. And you get the fatwa machine coming. And they start quoting verses from the Quran and narrations of Rasulullah But if you start analyzing it, that's the problem. Is most people, most of us, we don't analyze anything. We don't ponder over anything. You just hear it and that's it. But if you start analyzing it, you start realizing, you know, this is totally out of context. You know, like the fatwa, the, the, the Wahhabi Saudi fatwa, that if anyone, and this actually is a fatwa of Ibn Taymiyyah, which was reiterated and emphasized by Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. Ibn Taymiyyah, of course, he has two fatwas for everything. So this is one of the, so he has one fatwa on this side, and one fatwa on this side. So if somebody says, oh, he's, he said this. Oh, no, 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 he didn't say that. He said this. You know, it's like the joke of the, uh, of the uh, gynecologist who was never wrong as to whether, you know, the child was going to be a boy or a girl. You know, because the parents would come and the gynecologist would tell them, oh, you're going to have a baby girl. And he'd write down in his book that they're going to have a boy. So if a girl's born, he says, oh, see, I told you. And if, if, you know, if it's a boy, if it's a boy and they say, oh, you told us it's going to be a girl. No, no, see, I wrote it right here. <laughs> so that's exactly what, what, what he did. So on one side you have this fatwa that, that uh, Mawlid is, is good because our, learn, our children learn from it about Rasulullah so, And on the other side he said, no, this is uh, imitating the non-Muslims, so this is haram. So the same way he says in one place, he says, you know, it's good to go and visit uh, or go, go to Medina Munawwara. But on the other side he says that if anyone visits the Rauda of Ras or, or goes to Medina Munawwara, he says, if anyone goes to Medina Munawwara with the intention of visiting or meeting Rasulullah he has committed shirk. Because Rasulullah said you can only travel to three masajid. So you have to go with the intention of traveling to the masjid. Traveling with the, the intention of traveling to a masjid has nothing to do with the intention of visiting Rasulullah Most people, they don't make that connection. That, oh, you know, this, this proof that he give, is giving me has no context or it has no relationship to what he's saying. Ah, so, oh, see, this, this scholar, because again, he has funding and, and a position. So, oh, this scholar said this. It must be true. The problem is, Imam Hussein al-Islam, he didn't just talk about the ruler. He also talked about the believer who, who doesn't do anything against them within his capability. He mentioned that. He said, within your capability. Because not everybody can, can physically do something. Some people can simply say something. And when it comes to the honor of Rasulullah so some, if we can't even say anything, then what kind of Muslim are we? Hmm? Because if you look at the basis of the ideology, it, it doesn't simply attack the practices of Islam. Those are secondary issues for them. The basis of the ideology attacks the honor and the character of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So as Imam Hussein al-Islam has taught us, and he was taught by his grandfather, that if we are silent in these issues, then on the day of judgment we shouldn't expect to be anywhere other than where these leaders are going to go. You know, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, on the day of judgment, he, he place us among the party of Imam Hussein al-Islam. 
But if we don't defend the honor of Imam Hussein as well, we're going to end up in the party of Yazid. I'm going to end here today, inshallah. Uh, we'll continue from here next week. But, you know, again, it doesn't matter as far as governments. And just, well, I'll take another minute. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you know, he said, uh, talking about the end times, he says that at that time, no place will be safe for the believers except Makkah and Medina. And if you look throughout the world, that is exactly what's going on now. It's going to get a lot worse, unfortunately. But this is, you, you, we can see within the past few years just the, the, the acceleration of all of these changes. But even in Makkah, Medina, even though Dajjal, Antichrist, will not be able to enter those cities physically, but he will be able to influence things. And this is where Rasulullah Sallam talks about where he saw him in a dream. And he sees Isa al-Islam making tawaf. And then he sees Dajjal making tawaf. And he describes them both, but he sees Dajjal making tawaf. But Dajjal isn't making tawaf on his own. Dajjal is making tawaf on the shoulders of two men. So even though he's not going to be able to enter physically, his agents will be there. And they are there now. This is why, you know, the religious police of the Saudis, they tell you, oh, to say, Ya Rasulullah is haram. It makes the masjid dirty. They tell you, oh, there's no need to come to the road of Rasulullah. You don't need to go to Jannah al You can just make dua anywhere you are. You don't need to go there. And then you say, well, then why do I need to go to, to Makkah? No, oh, astaghfirullah. You know, because for them it's a money issue. Hajj for them isn't, isn't a spiritual issue. Hajj is, oh, we get revenue. Allah protect us from all of this, inshallah. Uh, may He fill our hearts with His true love and the true love of His, of his beloved Prophet Muhammad, wasallam, His family, His companions, and all of those whom they love. And may He, on the Day of Judgment, raise us among those who are the supporters of Imam Hussain, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah, inshallah.